Okay, we're live now. Good. Go ahead with the roll call. Sure thing. So Economic Development Committee roll call. Uh, Commissioner Cawthorn. Present. Commissioner Gage Watts. Present. Thank you very much. Co uh, Commissioner Atkins is absent. Uh, Commissioner John Paul Young. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Burrell and Commissioner Johnson. Present. Thank you very much. You have four of six members present. That is a quorum. All right. Good afternoon. Welcome to our uh, Economic Development Committee meeting for March 31st, 2020. Uh, I will ask that uh, Commissioner uh, Young do the invocation and um, Commissioner Gage Watts do the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, uh, please join me if you choose in the, Lord, in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, are there any adi uh, agenda additions? Uh, I'm not aware of any agenda additions if you don't have any. Um, the But at this time, it would be appropriate if uh, you want to entertain a motion to approve the consideration of the items. So move. Second. Second. Okay, and did you want me to do a roll call vote or do you want to do that by acclamation? We do that by acclamation. Okay. And we need to do the certification of teleconference. So we, we have the certificate of teleconference attached. Uh, like you said, just to note that it's there, there's no action required. Um, and that'll bring us to public comments. Uh, the public comments are available both electronically uh, through the link provided on the website uh, or uh, by phone. We have not received any electronic comments today, um, but that phone number, should anybody want to make public comments, is 318-226-6596. Again, that's 318-226-6596. Okay, and what we could do is uh, give them uh, 30 seconds, and then we'll move on to our new business. We'll do it. All right, we'll move on to new business. Uh, good morning, good afternoon again, everyone. Uh, at this juncture in the meeting, what we're wanting to do at this time is to hear presentations from two uh, economic development experts that we have that are making presentations for us today to give us an insight as to how we move forward uh, with the uh, the uh, Shreveport Cattle Economic Development Authority. As you guys know, I will remember, probably almost nine years ago now, we embarked upon implementing this uh, authority here with the parish of Cattle and the uh, city of Shreveport. And for political reasons and from disagreements, it kind of didn't go anywhere. Uh, now, I think it's a propitious opportunity to resurrect this. And we want to hear from some economic experts who will give us presentation as to how they will move forward with it, best practices and overall view of how they can be of an assistance to cattle parish relative to our economic development. So we have two gentlemen present today and we will just go by the way they're listed on the agenda. 
And our first uh, presenter is Quentin, Quentin Messer. Uh, and, Mr. Uh, Chairman. And his uh, resume is attached. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Point, point of information, uh, since I wasn't here nine years ago, could you kind of uh, uh, tell me what this is? I mean, you said it was an economic uh, cattle, uh, city of Shreveport cattle economic development, uh, something okay. I didn't quite get to. Okay, what it, it, the, 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 the acronym is SCUDA, and what we, it was called and proposed by a previous economic development person was the Shreveport Cattle Economic Development Authority. And essentially what it, what it was uh, tasked to do was to create an authority that's a combination and a partnership between the city of Shreveport and Parish of Cattle to bring in economic development activities, economic development uh, possibilities, and, and to work collectively as a unit. We had found in the past that we kind of stumbled over one, one another. And so we thought it would be hand in glove if both the city and the parish were on the same page. So uh, the former consultant did put together this particular idea, which is called Scudder. And his name escapes me right now for some reason, but um, so he's kind oh, of been out of he's been, Say that again. You know, Mr. Dobbs. Mr. Dobbs. Mr. Dobbs. Mr. Dobbs. And so the thrust was to have four people uh, represented and appointed by the city of Shreveport, four people appointed and represented by the parish of Cattle. And so in that conflation of putting all this together, that came to be a, a, a part of the way, sort of, between the parish and the city on some appointments, the, the specifics of it, uh, I don't recall, but at any rate, um, it kind of stalled and nothing has happened since then. So as the Economic Development Chair this year, I thought it would be a good opportunity to uh, represent this. And, and it's definitely something that is useful in the city of Shreveport and the Parish of Cattle. Does Thank that you, give sir. you some backdrop? Yeah, yeah, that, that's helpful. Okay. Thank you. Again, so we will start with our first, first presentation with uh, Quentin Messer, and uh, his resume is attached. And so without any further ado, I'll let him jump right into what he's looking to do today. Thank you so much, Commissioner Car Carthorne uh, and the other commissioners, thank you for your public service. Uh, look, I um, want to begin by giving you 90 seconds about who I am and then just uh, sort of uh, maybe a few minutes about best practices and then some thoughts about how do you bring the best assets that are in, in Shreveport and Caddo Parish um, to the marketplace. So uh, Quentin Messer Jr., I'm president and CEO of the New Orleans Business Alliance. We're the local accredited uh, economic development organization in New Orleans, Louisiana. Immediately prior to coming to uh, the New Orleans Business Alliance, I was Assistant Secretary for Economic Development in the state of Louisiana at LED. Uh, I serve on the board of the International Economic Development Council. In fact, I chair, I'm co-chair of their Racism and Economic Development Committee and as well as serve on their committee for professional practice. Um, so I've spent a lot of time uh, thinking about economic development and get asked quite a bit to opine about best practices. Um, so I think there are three big picture takeaways that I want to uh, mention and then I can uh, dive in to uh, those during a Q&A session because I was told to keep this short. Number one, I think it's critically important that uh, not only your local businesses, but your businesses that you're hoping to attract to Shreveport Caddo understand a single front door that they need to enter and with whom they need to communicate. The one thing, and, and it's the old adage, time is money, particularly in a post-pandemic world, competition is becoming much more intense. You have more workers working remotely. You have companies reassessing their real estate footprints. You have a lot of people making decisions based upon hey, you know, I can live anywhere. I've, I've gone a year with Zoom. I don't necessarily have to be in, in Seattle, Washington, or San Francisco, California, New York, uh, New York, or Washington, D.C. If I'm from Shreveport or I'm from the Dallas metro area, maybe I'll look for Shreveport because it's lower cost. 
I love the quality of life. I love the weather, whatever the myriad of reasons to be. So this is a tremendous opportunity. But having said that, I, I think the number two is, is that I think businesses are becoming more and more impatient with economic development and they want to know who is that one person or one entity that can make a decision for me as I evaluate whether or not I'm going to invest um, in, a, in, in region A or region B. Uh, and the third thing I will tell you is um, there are tremendous assets in Shreveport Cattle Parish. I think the biggest challenge facing is how do you uh, bring those assets to bear? How do you continue to educate people about uh, maybe there is a misperception that Shreveport is largely an oil and gas or gaming base economy? How do you talk about some of the other um, assets that you have to the table? Um, so I think those are three things. One, in making sure that you have a single entity that can tell more powerfully the Shreveport Cattle Parish story. Uh, second, um, time is money. People understanding the ease of walking through a single front door so they don't have to go through multiple hoops or hire a local consultant to help them navigate. I mean, Shreveport Car Cattle Parish is sufficiently large, but it's also a manageable level where you should be able to have a single entity. And, and, and the last uh, point is the point I began with before, this is now the time to really bring this back up. So kudos to this entire committee for, for doing so because you are at a very auspicious time. The last thing I would say is, you know, one of the things that can sort of uh, gum up the works is really an issue of representation. And I think the way to really think about this is you really want the representation of whatever entity you decide to do to really represent the assets in the region. So for example, if I were drawing this up, I would suggest you have someone from the Biomedical Research Foundation, someone from um, Southern Shreveport, someone from LSU Shreveport, um, someone from LSU Health Sciences Center, Centenary College, the city of Shreveport, Caddo Parish, the Convention and Visitors Bureau, the regional airport, Willis Knighton. Um, that gets you to about 10. And then you could potentially have three at large and you have no more than 13 folks who really bring all the assets and represent the various interests so that you can really get um, the perspective. And I think it's critically important to bring in not only the transportation assets with the port and the airport, but also you need to make sure you bring in your tourism assets. And that's the reason why I would add the Convention and Business Bureau, because at the end of the day, you have to tell a holistic um, story. So let me pause there and I will um, at the appropriate time be um, happy to address any questions. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mercer. Uh, committee members, at this juncture, do we have any questions? Um, I, I do, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Commissioner Burrell. Uh, Mr. Messner, I, I, I think I, I might know this name from being down there in state government um, when you were at LED. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when you were there, but it seemed like that name comes up. Uh, are, are you uh, pretty well familiar with, with Shreveport's economy? I know that you named off some things there, but I'm sure that uh, you can get that from the part from the internet. But are you familiar with kind of the internal workers of Shreveport are mostly Baton Rouge and New Orleans? So, uh, yes, I remember when you were a state rep, um, Commissioner Burrell, I was at LED from 2012 to 2015, um, just okay. to complete the story. Uh, no, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be candid. I'm much more familiar with New Orleans and Baton Rouge because that's where I've spent my professional career. When I was um, at the state level, I did have exposure to Shreveport, but I like to think of myself as a pretty quick study. I'm a former management consultant at BCG. I've practiced corporate law, so uh, I can pretty much understand the contours of the economy. I think the, 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 I would say the contours of the local economy are less important than can you quickly get businesses to an answer? Meaning, are, do you, are there incentives that they can provide? How, how easy is the permitting? Am I talking to the right people to make a judgment? And I think those things are, are, are universal uh, across particular municipalities. I agree with that. And, and, and one of the things that 
strikes me here is the fact that uh, oh, about 15 years ago, uh, uh, I think I was on the city council and one of the, one of the criticism that uh, persons who wanted to bring economic development issues here, especially involved in the minority community uh, was that they had no single point of entrance, no point person or group that they could go to and really talk about the issues uh, that they would be facing coming in. So am I understanding you to say that a service that you provide will provide that? Right, I think working in conjunction with the leadership here, the thought process is, is developing um, that single entity, whatever it's going to be called. And that's really for you. My, my role is really to provide, um, I think really three things. One, an objective independent perspective uh, based upon uh, best practice from economic development to a practitioner's perspective. Um, yeah, because I'm in the marketplace every day because that's my job every day in, in representing New Orleans. And I think the third thing is really to try to um, help um, Shreveport Ca Cattle Parish avoid some of the challenges that other regions have, have faced. I will tell you, there's a trend nationally to see a merging of multiple economic development entities, particularly those that represent maybe a, a, a county as well as a, a, as a, as a core large city inside that county, you're seeing emerging, uh, 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 emerging of that. You, you certainly have seen that in the St. Louis region. Uh, you, you've, you've seen it in Evanston, um, Indiana, and, and it's, it's, it's something that's sort of going and, and gaining steam nationally. Okay, well, final question, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, we have had several different economic development organizations that's supposed to represent our area uh, uh, to encourage commerce and stuff to come to our area. And I've, I've had mixed feelings about them. Uh, our latest being uh, the NLEP, Northwest Louisiana Economic uh, Partnership, um, which have done some things, but it appears that their loyalties uh, it is not so much to Shreveport as it is to the whole region. Uh, so am I hearing you say that this would be more specific and more specified and more targeted, your, your work? Yes, I mean, and I'm quite familiar with um, NLEP, um, uh, particularly their, their predecessor, Scott Martinez, who also serves, who now is in Tyler, Texas, but serves on the board of IEDC. I think, um, Commissioner Burrell, I think the, the critical question is, is people need to know their role and play their, play their assignment. The assignment for NLEP is to represent the entire I-20 corridor at the top of the state. And the reason why it's so critically important to have this integrated single entity representing three poor cattle parish is you need someone, you know, let, so think about it. Frequently what will happen, and I'll just, indulge me for 90 seconds. A prospect will say, hey, look, I want to be along the I-20 corridor. I'm indifferent about where on the I-20 corridor in Louisiana. It could be Monroe, it could be somewhere in between, or it could be Shreveport Cattle Parish. For NLEP, the win is getting it on the I-20 corridor. What I'm proposing, what I think all of you desire, and I think it makes perfect sense, is to have an entity, a single entity, that basically says, here's why you wanna have it in Shreveport Cattle Parish and not in, 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 in Monroe or Washita Parish or anywhere else along the I-20 corridor knowing that you're indifferent. And that can only be uniquely done by something that's centered, focused and represents the interests of Shreveport Cattle Parish. You can't expect NLEP to do that because they've got to represent the entire you know, 10 parish region along the I-20 corridor. Well, that's been one of my my biggest gripes, I guess, over, over the period because I have an economic development background too. And uh, and that is sitting in the chamber, uh, in, in the chambers and, and when companies come, uh, Shreveport spent spend a lot of money marketing 
to bring companies here. And once it gets here, uh, you know, nothing against Bozier, but, 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 but to see it to go to Bozier because, you know, many times they'll, they'll promote Bozier as a safe place to be, blah, 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 and all this other stuff. Although we spent all our money to get them here and we wind up losing them at the last minute because no one, nobody is there to really uh, push for street or street cattle, street, street or cattle. So that's been one of my biggest beefs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Commissioner uh, Burrell. Yeah, we're going to be putting on the pom poms for Shreveport Gatto. Uh, Commissioner Johnson? Yes, two questions I had. One question was How do you um, prevent public record requests if you're working directly with a local government? And two, you, you talked about a panel. Um, what um, like labor union be also a member of that panel? Sure, great question. So um, let me answer them in reverse order. One, um, I, I propose just, you know, and look, ultimately it's the decision of this, of the elected officials or who they want to be on the panel. I, I would recommend um, that you, I think one way to depoliticize it, if you can ever depoliticize anything, is to have the, the, uh, at least a, a majority of the panel represent the assets that are present in Shreveport and Cattle Parish. And then you could have three at large and labor unions certainly could be one of the three or, or whoever else at this panel, uh, the, the, the commissioners decide in those three, I just pose 13. I and mean, then there's no magic number to 13. I just think that you don't want it to be a, a cast of thousands um, but you'd also want it to be sufficiently large enough that you have diverse interests, including the voices of labor, because you have to have the voice of the employer, but you also have to have the voice of job creators. You have to have the voice of, of higher ed because they key your, your talent. You have to have the voice of K-12. So there, there, there are a number of, of permutations, but I, I just sort of gave you um, one person, but ultimately that would be this body. The decision about how they want representation to the first question about avoiding public requests, I, I, I would say um, that is something that has to be thoughtfully done. If this, if, if this entity that we're talking about is going to be a public body and receive the predominance of its funding from public sources, then there's going to be no way under Louisiana open meetings law to avoid that. I think one of the things then people have to be educated, and I'm sure this group is sophisticated enough to do this, is to make sure that you know companies typically like not to talk about certain things or negotiate in public because things can go wrong. So the, the, the importance of discretion and things of that nature. The alternative is, is if you structure it as an independent 501c3, and the predominance of its funding comes from private sources, then potentially you could avoid that. But I, I think there's no need of trying to be cute about it. You might as, you, you should prepare to, to, to operate under the current Louisiana open meetings law and really ask people to sign an NDA or level set expectations with various prospects. I think that's probably the better way to go. I hope that was responsive, Commissioner Johnson. Yes, that's good. Thank you. Okay. Is there uh, any other commissioner with a question? I'll either committee member or mid commissioner that's on the call who wants to a, uh, pose a question to Mr. Messer. I have a question, Ooh. Commissioner Carpenter. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't see your hand. Go ahead, Commissioner Young. I couldn't get my hand to raise because I'm using my phone, but thank you. Oh, okay. Um, I, I had two questions. One is, uh, Mr. Messer, what kind of industry do you think we should be targeting for? growth in Caddo Parish, Shreveport. And the second one is, uh, this might not be uh, your, your plan exactly, but what, what do you consider the nature of the authority of uh, SCADA? Is it a taxing authority or some other authority? So thank you, Commissioner Young. So when you, uh, let me deal with the questions in reverse order. Uh, when you talk about authority, are you meaning the legal statute by which this entity can exist or 
what what specific do you mean by authority? Because I mean, if, if you're asking, do I think this proposed entity should um, be able to have economic development tools like incentives or pilots or, or, or other things to use in order to incent companies to move and more importantly, incent existing companies to stay and reinvest? I think the answer is yes. But if you're saying about do I think it should be, you know, if you're asking me what the legal, I think that's, those are for elected um, public officials to answer. But to your first question about specific industries that you should target, I, I, would, answer the answer, I would answer the question in this way. I think the, the first thing that any economic developer worth his or her salt would tell you is you have to be opportunistic. You go where the love is. And Shreveport Cattle Parish is known as a place for smart people who know the energy sector. They also, you know, because of the, 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 you know, the proximity to Bossier City, I know that's Bossier Parish, but still there's a perception about gaming. So I think you got to, and, and there's obviously agribusiness and there's obviously biomedical bio and there's a movie industry with software development. So I think you, you got to, you know, um, the old adage, you got to, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a dance with who brought me. So I think the, 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 you know, street poor cattle bearers would be wise to do that. But the point too, is I think you build upon successes like Bentler still. I think you, 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 you build upon successes like Moonbot as you try to aggressively diversify uh, the economy. But I think the critical last point is, I think it's something that Commissioner Burrell mentioned in his questions, is we've got to deal with particularly, not only are we coming out of a pandemic, but we're coming out of a racial reckoning as well. And we have to deal with income and wealth disparities for black, brown, and indigenous people. So we need to make sure that whatever entity, whatever you decide to do, has an aggressive focus on making sure that small businesses can thrive, particularly those for BIPOC communities, because what, what, we, what studies have shown, whether it's McKinsey or my former uh, employer, um, the Boston Consulting Group has shown, is when you develop solutions and opportunities for BIPOC entrepreneurs and small businesses, everybody benefits. Because you're solving, if you can solve the problems facing them, you're solving some of the most intractable challenges that prevent market-based solutions and market-based success. Um, so I think those are the three imperatives, I would say, as you think about what you're trying to attract. You, the, the, the best client or the best company is the company that's already based in Shreveport, Cattle Parish. You want to keep them there. You want them to grow there. And I think that there is a, a powerful argument to be made for really reaching out and trying to get all the Shreveport expats to rethink and relook at Shreveport, but all the while focus on reducing um, uh, capital availability and other challenges that BIPOC entrepreneurs face. Okay, thank you. I think maybe uh, regarding the authority question that I asked, it might be a question Commissioner Cawthorn has a better answer on or someone who has a, a little more history of this proposal um, because we have, since it's called Streetport Caddo Economic Development Authority, we have a couple of authorities uh, operating in uh, Caddo Parish now, like the Downtown Development Authority. And my understanding is that its, uh, its main authority is the authority to raise a millage that it then um, uses to um, help fund projects. Well, so, you know, I, I, I think when, when this was originally put in place and was being thought about, I don't know if the name, if the letter, the word authority was placed on it um, because not the consultant was from North Carolina, but and in, in Commissioner Johnson can correct me if I'm misstating. Uh, we never got to the to the extent that whether it was going to be an authority, whether they could raise bonds or they could do a bond issue and all that sort of thing. As much as they were more concerned about the city and the parish having a collective effort, uh, a nuclear place where potential economic development deals could come through them and it could be bannered back and forth 
for a win-win for both the parish and the city. How far along they got down the road in terms of specificity to the structure, I'm just not 100% sure. And I don't know if that answers your question for you, but that's the the extent of the, the thought process that I recall. Okay, yes, it does answer my question. I think the answer is we'll have to answer that going forward. Thank you. Yes, yes. Uh, Commissioner Burrell? Uh, one other, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, as I think back over uh, some of the years that we've been, we, uh, some of us have kind of been on that, that battlefield trying to encourage and, and, and strengthen our minority business sector because that is a, you know, that is the growing population. We talked about this whenever Shreveport, Cato, uh did not have a majority uh, African-American base. But in terms of economics, uh, we've always had a problem trying to uh, incorporate uh, the minority business community into the mainstream economy. We talked about David Dodd. Uh, uh, I'm familiar with, with the work going back almost 20 years uh, with him and Ed Morrison and, 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 and people like that who, who talked about the fact that uh, this particular uh, area was be becoming more uh, ethnically uh, pronounced. But our, uh, but our economy continued to leave them out from his perspective, what does he see that, is, that has occurred elsewhere that has brought the minority business community more into the mainstream? Because that is one of our number one problems going forward, in my opinion. Uh, I, you know, when I was on the city council, I worked to try to build joint ventures because what I realized then, almost 20 years ago, that many times when business come to the table, the, the people that you're looking at and negotiate is not all is not all white and they're not all black. They're you know there are different ones who are 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 becoming uh, a part of corporations or, or companies that you got to deal with or businesses that you have to deal with, and they have a more diverse leadership uh, group and. I thought it was important that, that you had joint venturing so that whenever you go there, you know, you would have a pretty much both, you know, both ethnic groups. So my question again is, where does he see that uh, going forward in terms of growing that particular business interest, in that business sector associated with minority companies? So Commissioner Bavrell, when you uh, insert uh, ethnic pronounced, you mean majority black? That we're moving to a majority uh, black city? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, to, to be politically correct, I guess you would do that. Okay, go because ahead. That's, that, because that's the way it's going. I'm sure he's had experience or should have experience elsewhere. Even New Orleans didn't have a real strong business base at one time in terms of African-American business, but they, they've learned to somehow transition some, they're not where they should be, I don't think, but at least it's going in that direction. Shreveport has that same problem, but we're about 30 years behind. Well, yeah, I, so, you know, it, uh, it is a, it's a comp, it's a great question. It's a complex question. Let me try to um, deal with it maybe in three parts. I think part number one, I think you're absolutely right, Commissioner Burrell, continuing to to try to promote joint ventures. I mean, one of the things that we've done in New Orleans is that we have a procurement council where some of the largest uh, businesses in, 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 uh, in New Orleans publicly post their opportunities on a, on a website that, that we at the Business Alliance maintain such that businesses, particularly those uh, BIPOC folks um, can, can find those opportunities. Because one of the biggest challenges is information asymmetry. You know, sometimes, people just aren't in the circle. And so you have to try to democratize the, the opportunities. I think that's number one. Two is I do think um, expanding the opportunity for all is going to be beneficial ultimately for the BIPOC community. Um, so I think it, it, if, if, if as, 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 once you build this 
this organization or entity, whatever you, whatever you ultimately decide to do, and it is blowing and going and representing the best of Shreveport cattle and telling folks about the, all the assets, particularly those assets that are outside of gaming and, and oil and gas and traditional and agribusiness, traditional industries for which people know Shreveport, I think you're going to see growth and that growth is going to be beneficiary, uh, going to benefit BIPOC, uh, particularly Black community. But I think the final thing, and this is something that this group um, as elected officials can do is you have to begin to try to, as best as you can, the Louisiana statue, sort of encourage and reward those larger entities that are doing business or willing to invest in BIPOC communities. Now, obviously, you know, I think it happened under the Foster administration. Commissioner Burrell probably would know better than me, but you can't have programs based upon, <laughs> bless you, based upon color um, or any other um, differentiation. That would be inviolated. But I think that there are things that can be done to make participation and joint ventures with, with black and indigenous and person of color owned businesses a plus factor potentially, or it could be something that could factor in whether uh, companies who are looking to expand or relocate receive incentives or receive some sort of tax abatements, things of that nature. So there are certainly tools in the toolkit available to this body um, to use in order to address that, but it, it's, it's going to take time. And I know that people are, are justifiably impatient, but it will take time. Well, I, I agree, Mr. Chairman, uh, on that because as I looked into that when I was in the legislature, uh, 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 over the Economic Development Committee for the Black Caucus, it's written in the Constitution of Louisiana that you can't have special programs. And, and that was a hindrance. At least at one time, we were able to create programs and, and that led to uh, Governor Jindal actually dismantling all of the uh, programs, uh, minority business support programs while I was there. Uh, but it was that one constitutional statute that was in there that that really kind of killed that portion that was giving us a leg up at one time but uh but if there are ways in which we can work around it i think that's going to have to take place because the problem is still there thank you mr chairman thank you very much are there any more questions for mr mercer messer i'm sorry <laughs> all right so we thank you for your presentation and uh, now we will move on to, uh, and I'm gonna make sure I'm pronouncing Charles' last name correct. It's it Watley? Correct. Yeah, uh, I guess we should have had this meeting in your office. I see the backdrop is. <laughs> Trust me, the real background might not be that nice. <laughs> might be a little messier. <laughs> All right, well, Mr. Watley is from Atlanta, Georgia. His resume is attached. And so at this juncture, we will let him make his presentation. Thank you. Um, quick introduction and, um, and then just a few thoughts and we can get to some more questions and discussion. Um, I'm Charles Watley, I'm based in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, for seven years, I was with what was then called the Atlanta Development Authority and is now Invest Atlanta. Um, I headed up the economic development team uh, and then worked on my projects were the Porsche North American headquarters, College Football Hall of Fame, uh, Whipro Landing in, in Atlanta, uh, and so we spent a lot of time on business recruitment, retention, and expansion, uh, but also recognized that one of the challenges in urban areas is that there are no, there are very few easy greenfield projects. So there are always obstacles. So we created and expanded our toolkit, um, applied for new market tax credits in our application. I was on that team and led it. Um, we received $60 million in new market tax credit allocation our first our first time out. Um, we expanded our TIF or tax allocation districts in, in, in the city from four to 10. Uh, we built uh, a strong set of revolving loan programs, everything from small business to um, EPA revolving loan fund for environmental cleanup. Um, one of the things that happened when I first joined um, with the Atlanta Development Authority is that the city of Atlanta moved its economic development office 
into the development authority and provided funding. Uh, and that was an important thing in, in the sense that now you did have sort of a one-stop shop, uh, but it had a set of tools that the city really didn't use or couldn't use in the same way. Um, so the Atlanta Development Authority, if you look at Invest Atlanta now, it is the Atlanta Development Authority, which is a statutory authority in Georgia, the Downtown Development Authority, the Urban Residential Finance Authority, and the Atlanta Urban um, redevelopment agency. So it's really four statutory authorities and then a number of incorporations, one for the Atlanta Beltline, that's a subsidiary that's in charge of the implementation of that large scale infrastructure project. Um, Atlanta Emerging Markets, which is the new market tax credit um, entity. So Beltline and, and Atlanta Emerging Markets have distinct boards, but the other four authorities basically have the same board. Um, so those board meetings are held on the same day. Uh, and what it allows staff to do is to bring the tools from the appropriate authority to a project. Um, and so we look at economic development as critically linked with community development. So while the city maintained some, many of the community development programs, we had a number of tools that were more friendly to the private sector that allowed us to develop, um, co-develop or support and finance student housing, dormitories on a private college campus, um, assist with brownfield cleanup, uh, and participate in some mixed use development in ways that the city or, or even the counties that we, we would work with could not do it. Um, city of Atlanta sits in two counties and the airport sits partially in a third. So coordination is always an issue. Um, bringing the authorities under one umbrella gave us the ability to coordinate, but then the city made another commitment. We created an economic development sub cabinet that met twice a month for two hours each meeting. And that sub cabinet included all of the key officers and department heads at the authority and all of the commissioners and deputy commissioners from the city uh, and the city's chief operating officer chaired that committee, the sub cabinet, and I actually handled the agenda. And so what it meant was that there were no surprises to the city about projects in the pipeline. So we would use code names if necessary so that they weren't exposed. Um, we would give presentations but not have a lot of email exchange about the projects. The state had a system of naming projects and not exposing the companies. And so we, we sort of adhered to that. But what it did allow is that we knew early on whether or not a particular project was going to be a real possibility or whether we had some infrastructure challenges in an area that would make that a real difficult or costly exercise to go after that project. So we looked at the economic development field sort of in two ways, the coordination between the public sector the authority and then private resources we might be able to bring to the table. Um, and also we looked at it from the standpoint that the authority had to behave somewhat like a merchant bank rather than a government entity. We had to have the flexibility to go out and be transparent with the businesses we worked with, create ways to attract gap capital. So we think about it, Development authorities and cities really aren't bankers to the private sector. We're gap capital providers. That on a typical project, the private sector probably is gonna provide 90% of the capital. And what they're asking for from the public side is maybe 10%, sometimes a little more. Um, and so we saw that as a critical um, set of tools to use. We memorialize these through intergovernmental agreements. So the city originally ran all of the small business programs. They moved all of those that, had, that they hadn't moved yet over to the authority for both um, the management, accounting. And so those grants, there was an intergovernmental agreement that then transferred those grants to the authority. So we ended up with probably six or seven small business programs, some for firms that had been rejected, others for firms that were growing. We used the program income that came in from new markets for more flexibility on larger scale projects. 
And then we partnered with community development finance institutions for other specialized programs. So uh, in, the, in the metro area of Atlanta, ACE, Access to Capital for Entrepreneurs is a substantial CDFI. And so they set up a women's center. They set up another center that works closely with um, veterans. And in some cases, the authority might provide $50,000 a year to cover office overhead or give them space in one of our facilities so that they could then be on the ground and close to the, that client base. Um, so we looked at those partnerships as critical in terms of implementation, bringing new perspectives, and then giving us some nuances to the tools that were available so that it all didn't come through that public realm. Uh, one of the arguments for moving a lot of this away from City Hall um, was that in previous iterations, companies would come and request loans from the city, and then that loan application had to go before city council. And so, you know, the firms that would be approved, that was good news. The firms that were rejected, that was also now public information. And so that presented some reluctance for someone to go to, a, to the city for those small business loans that may have been vital, but the fear of rejection and that rejection then being a public, in the public record was problematic. Um, another thing that we did was that um, we created an economic development plan jointly with the city. And that was really important. Um, in, in, in a later position, I was working for a county, so similar to a parish. And the difficulty there was that the county sought to impose their economic development plan on the cities, when in Georgia, the cities actually had more tools to do economic development than the county did. And so we had to work really hard to get the county to appreciate the fact that it's better to partner than to try to push the city in a particular direction. That at the end of the day, the businesses you attract, the private investments you attract, they're really looking for transparency, consistency. And you know, if you use a baseball analogy, they understand that municipalities, governmental entities have certain laws. So occasionally there'll be a, a fastball that sort of brushes them back off the plate. It's the curveball at their head that makes them upset that all of a sudden something comes up, no warning, no understanding of what the, you know, of, of, of how this game is being played. And so the authority was able to, on the front end, to sort of set those guidelines. And I think, you know, again, most things are gonna have some political component, there may be community pushback, but the authority was charged with not only the business transaction, but also, understanding the community and the political climate so that you could make those, you could make that work and getting the private sector to understand the language being spoken by the, poli the political side and the community side. Um, so in the private sector now, as I consult, I, I consider myself and joke with my clients that I'm a translator, that the real estate developers understand return on equity, return on their investment, so forth but they don't necessarily understand what the private sector does and why it does it a certain way. It doesn't, it doesn't look like normal course of business to them, but that may be because the state law says you have to do X, Y, and Z, which is not what a private sector deal would look like. And so I think those things are, are important as well. Um, you know, I think that, that an authority of any sort has to have a robust set of tools and so I think that um, to the extent that your economic development team is strong at recruitment, it also needs to have some strong players on it that understand not just the incentives, but the financing tools to the extent that they can craft unique deals that make sense, that are, that are um, appropriate for the particular client and particular project and uh, can get you over the hump and the impediments that may be in the way. Um, so I think that, you know, I'll open it up for questions. I think the, the, the last thing I'll say before that though, is that, you know, when I was in it with the Atlanta Development Authority, I was working during the, 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 the big recession. 
So I've seen these sort of seismic changes. Um, I've been in private sector during the pandemic and what we're seeing more and more um, large scale business recruitment and real estate development really can't go it alone if what you expect them to deliver will also provide some of the public policy objectives and goals you have. The reality will be that if they go pure market, there will all in like all likelihood, um, they're gonna go the path of least resistance. So you may end up with product that's developed in your community that's good, but it's not the best it could be and it may not be as inclusive as you want it to be. So these public private partnerships between uh, an authority supported um, and coordinated with the, with, with the municipality and the private sector can yield some different benefits that I think are important as you look to move these communities forward. Um, one thing I would say that, we, that, I, that I think is important too is that one of the things we found on our, in our business recruitment was we, we became selective about who we went after and what. So a manufacturer from China that wants 150 acres, Atlanta is not the place to be. We don't have 150 acres that makes sense for manufacturing. Um, but firms in India that were gonna do R&D in, in, in the tech space or life sciences, um, that matter. And even in the life sciences, we realized we were better suited for medical devices than for pharmaceuticals. So in, in Atlanta, and think about this for, for the Shreveport area, um, the industries that are already there spawn new industries. So in Atlanta, I can find a C-level, C-level suite executives in consumer goods because of Coca-Cola and Home Depot. I can find them in secure internet security, healthcare, but I cannot find C-level executives in pharmaceuticals. So the co company that lands in Atlanta for pharmaceuticals will have to recruit nationally to bring everyone here. And so that makes it a tougher recruitment. So understanding the industries you have, what they spawn, what they're best related to often is very helpful as you think about the industries you look at to grow it. Um, and I think, you know, uh, Quentin Messer is perfectly correct in the sense that, you know, you have a constellation of assets that are already there and they need to be engaged because they're seeing things on the horizon. They're hearing about opportunities. They have connections. So with the Metro Chamber in Atlanta, we looked at who was on what boards, who was involved with, with, with what new initiatives. And from that, we were able to, uh, to create some pretty good initiatives around venture capital, around um, you know, real estate product that was different, affordable housing. And so I think that all of that's really important as you think about how you create an authority that really can move the needle uh, across the board for economic and community development. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Wadlett. Uh, looks like you, Mr. Burrell, Commissioner Burrell, that's your hand for this time? Yes, sir. No, that's just oh, my hand, sir. Okay, go ahead. Well, I tell you what, Mr. Wiley has really said a mouthful. Um, I was trying to follow, follow him. I'm kind of a, a structured person myself, trying to keep in mind all the line of, uh, of uh, demarcations that he, that, that he was uh, uh, delineating there. Uh, let me first say that I, I had the opportunity to, to, to meet uh, with Maynard Jackson uh, when he was still living and even brought him to Shreveport uh, during the Hightower administration. And uh, he really gave me an earful of how things started then, but economic development during the time that he was there seemed to be a lot different than the way they are, uh, the way it is. Uh, uh, now, Mr. Watt, the way you all do it, a lot of things have changed. But just looking at, just listening at your presentation and trying to follow it as best I could, it sounded like that. Uh, you all, you know, to put all the things that you just stated to us into a form that you can understand, you will have a hell of an organizational chart if you if you look at it, trying to keep all the functions uh, separate. Just my observation from what you were telling me, it, it appears that, you know, you have a number of different types of authority that has different functions, separate functions, but 
it appears that some seem to overlap. If they don't overlap, then you can you can tell me that they don't overlap. I, I'm I'm going to make a couple of statements here, and then you could probably just answer them uh, collectively. I guess you would say. What comes to mind is uh, is the government is the government in your area, both city city parish uh, city county government. Are there no. any joint joint functions, or are they all separate? They're all separate, and that's a challenge. Okay. The second question is, um, there appear to be some overlapping of authorities, and if so, uh, how, do you, how do you keep those separate? So, so and that was one of the reasons um, that each of the authorities is created under a separate state statute. So the Deve Downtown Development Authority is separate from the uh, Development Authority statute. Downtown development authorities promote commerce, industry, trade, and employment opportunities, but can also do some public infrastructure projects. Development authorities support uh, commerce, industry, trade, and employment opportunities, but cannot do public infrastructure. Downtown development authorities can't do single family homes. Development authorities can. So. We, we had these authorities and according to the statute that they were created under, they gave us similar tools, but maybe nuances regarding the types of projects we could do. Um, and, and so that, and that's why it was important that the staff, so I was the head of economic development, but I was also vice president of the downtown development authority. Um, the only entity that I was not an officer of was the Urban Residential Finance Authority because affordable housing, housing finance was its, was its own area. And it had its own sets of compliance. It had over 10,000 units that they had financed. So it was a sort of a, a separate entity within the organization in that sense. But the other authorities overlapped. And, and in, in addition to the authorities, we had 60 plus um, separate LLCs, incorporations, and limited partnerships for projects that we had joint ventured or worked on with the private sector. Um, and so, so, so there is some complication to what we did, but it allowed deals that were more intricate, had, had uh, additional hurdles to be actually consummated rather than to have to walk away from them. Did I understand you to say also that you had an umbrella uh, some kind of umbrella board that was over all of this? Uh, did I misunderstand you? No, no, you understood. So what we ended up doing was that the, the boards for the Atlanta Development Authority, the Urban Residential Finance Authority, and um, I think for the Downtown Development Authority were the same three, the boards were made up of the same members. The Urban um, Redevelopment Agency was that board minus two members because, and we had elected officials on our board in addition to private sector. The mayor chaired, council member who was over community development, sat on the, by, by position. Um, a representative was selected from the county and one from the school board. Uh, and then the rest were, were business and one representative uh, dealing with community. Um, and so to, so that we didn't end up with you know, six board meetings a month. They, the board meeting, one board meeting date, four different board meetings convened at that date and time. Um, and so staff became familiar with the workings of each authority. And so if a deal came to me and I said, oh, this won't work in the development authority or the downtown development authority, it's a housing deal. I would immediately send it to the team members who were part of the residential finance authority so that they could vet it and determine whether it made sense for them. My final question, Mr. Wallace, is, is this, in terms of your authority, were all of them are taxing authorities? Uh, um, and if so, if so, uh, did they overlap, I mean, overlap, overlapping taxing authority? Uh, yes, how, how was you all able to separate that? Because I'm sure they had to have funding sources. Yeah, so no, we were not taxing authorities. We were, um, the city had the authority to dedicate up to three mills for economic development. 
and we would occasionally use that to support a project, but not our operating costs. So our operating costs came from um, deal flow. So we had charges for bond issuances, uh, application fees. We received uh, an allocation from the TIF districts for administration of the TIFs because the authority was the designated redevelopment agent for all of the TIFs in, in Atlanta. Um, we had direct, um, we had direct budgetary amount, probably a million dollars a year. But during the recession for three years, we didn't get a single penny from the city. And we really only had to reduce staff by about five or six people um, out of a staff of over 50. Um, we were able to generate enough. Urban Residential Finance Authority had annual compliance fees and bond issuance fees. So their revenue was significant. The TIFs had significant revenue and my department essentially generated revenue from the bond deals we closed and received uh, an issuer's fee of, uh, from those deals. Thank you, Mr. Wiley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you. Sir. Is there any, another committee member has a question? Well, I want to chime in and make a comment and ask a couple of questions myself. Uh, as the old saying goes that a man or woman can only look at life and where it's staying. And so it's quite apparent that in the city of Atlanta and the surrounding counties, that's been some tilling of the soil over the years. So even though people historically talk about Maynard Jackson, some people may or may not know, even prior to Maynard Jackson, that was a professor mayor by the name of Alan, uh, Ivan Allen, who, who was on the cusp of doing things. And as we discussed earlier today, that seems to already have been a meeting of the minds on the racial piece, and I like to call it when Sweet Autumn has already meet, has already had an introduction to Peachtree Street, <laughs> and so 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 people living in Atlanta know what I'm talking about. So and, and so what I'm saying is that's been some tilling of the soil, and what we want to do here in Shreveport, Louisiana, that soil hasn't been tilled, and the best way to kill and eat an elephant is one piece at a time. So if you had to structure, just give us a couple of nuggets of advice that if we wanted to replicate something similar to Atlanta, and I don't know if you're able to answer that question, but I have a full understanding of how Shreveport Cattle is structured. Uh, and, and, and also with the backdrop of us not having the hard paws of different Fortune 500 companies that are regionally located in our, in our region, what would be some of the nuggets in terms of a map that um, would be guidance for Cattle Shreveport? Yeah, well, I think that um, one of the things, and I think you know, Mr. Messer stated it well. You, your board needs to look like the assets and the businesses in your community, and that a big part of economic development is the degree to which your corporate folks are involved in civic engagement. Mm -hmm. So, to the extent that you know, I'm the CEO of a company interested in Shreveport. I call a buddy of mine who's um, you know, C-suite level or executive VP somewhere else. And I say, you know, what's, what's the climate in Shreveport politically or so forth? You need that person on your end of this call being accurate, but still being realistic about the qualities and positive aspects of what you do. You don't want them saying, no, you don't want to come here. <laughs> you, know, right, you, need right, right, them, right, you need right. them focused and on the same page with the same script um, and, you know, and there may be nuances, but they need to be able to say, look, I'm involved or I'm on the board of this and this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to move the needle. You'd be welcome here. There's a, there's a place for you in our community that matters. Um, you know, it, it, Atlanta does have a long history of civil rights, but that doesn't mean it was easy. We still had no. a lot, still have a lot of challenges. Right. And so, but civic engagement from key business leaders is critical um, to really turn in that ship to the, to the extent that it actually um, brings people to, the, to your port. I mean, that, that's a critical thing is that, that you need them and whether that's through the chamber, um, you know, there's some other cities, Chicago and Miami that have large diverse boards of corporate executives who sort of are the welcome map. So, you know, economic development is gonna be dealing largely with the toolkit it has it does some welcoming, welcoming, 
But for us, the Metro Chamber did all of the TLC that we couldn't do. Mm -hmm. They had a lot more flexibility. They had resources, take people to dinner and do some other things that, that, and have some conversations that we couldn't have necessarily. And so those welcoming arms, but they bought into our economic development plan, participated in it, um, supported it. And so that coordination is not just between the authority and the, and the municipalities, it's important that your industries understand it and support it as well. And it never hurt that you guys had Robert Woodford down there with Coca-Cola being an advocate. Yeah, that wasn't a bad years thing. Ago. <laughs> that wasn't a bad thing. <laughs> okay, are there any other uh, questions from any other committee members? What, what, what I would like to ask that uh, from both Mr. Messer and uh, Mr. Wildlit, that if you guys just can submit to our administration just a one pager of recommendations as a takeaway from this conversation. And uh, we do have one committee member that called me this morning and uh, he, he, uh, he had a scheduling conflict, but uh, he liked to, he wants to review this call and see the presentation that you guys have. A long story short, if you can sit that, submit that information to us and uh, then we can uh, in turn get back with you guys as to how we move forward. Okay. So again, thank you for your time. Thank you for your thank presentations. You. Thank, thank you all. You. Take care. Okay, Mr. Clerk, we're going to move on down the agenda. Uh, next, we want to discuss the African American uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, the annual request. Uh, I had a conversation with Billy Anderson, who's the executive director, along with the uh, current chairperson, uh, Brittany Don. And it looks like that's been uh, there's a switch over in terms of management over the chamber. There was a couple of things that uh, reports that needed to be submitted that weren't submitted. Um, if uh, and Haley, uh, well, I'll let I'll let Mr. Anderson, if he's the one going to do the presentation, go ahead and present to you guys uh, to present to us uh, what it is the chamber is doing and uh, how we can move your uh, request forward. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Cawthorn. I'm going to have a very brief presentation. Uh, I'll just update you guys about what's happening at the chamber and a little bit about our expo and some of the lunch and learn seminars we plan to do this year. All right, so this year the chamber actually celebrates 80 years in operation. Uh, the chamber was uh, formed as a necessity for uh, black business owners and black citizens of Treeport to come together and basically um, basically uh, recruit other members in the community, but also um, lobby on issues that deal with them and how they can progress black businesses in the Shreveport area. Our mission is to be the premier voice for African businesses in the community at large. Uh, we do that through advocacy, entrepreneurship, and economic development. And our vision is to be the ultimate resource for African-American business. And as you can see, here's a picture of our, uh, most of our newest board members, uh, but this is also a picture of our board members we had in the past year. Uh, currently, uh, we are sitting at 167 members, which is a great number. We've had uh, 49 new members join this year. Uh, we actually had a new member join last night, so we're sitting at 50 new members this year, uh, which is an incredible feat uh, considering all of the economic despair that we uh, suffered through last year pandemic. So we have new businesses that are joining the chamber, but we also have new businesses that are forming uh, in the city of Shreveport. Uh, we've actually done three ribbon cuttings this year so far. And then we have 12 corporate partners. Oh, so here are some of the events that we have done this year. Uh, what we found out is that a lot of African-American businesses uh, didn't know, uh, business owners didn't know the process or know if they qualified to, for PPP loans. So we did a seminar on that on uh, January 26th. Uh, we also got with the Shreveport Financial Empowerment Center to do a seminar about all of the free benefits they have at the uh, Shreveport Financial Empowerment, seminar, uh, Empowerment Center. 
Uh, what we found out is that they have free tax services for a lot of business owners. So if we had people in the Shreveport Caddo Parish area that weren't able to pay someone to do their taxes, you can actually get them done free at the uh, Empowerment Center. Throughout Black History Month, we had several programs. Uh, the first we kicked off with a fair share seminar with all of our members. So we were actually able to educate our members on what was required to be a uh, part of the fair share program and how they needed to apply. And then also throughout the month, we had several cash mobs at some minority owned businesses. Uh, and if you guys aren't familiar with cash mobs, that is where uh, predetermined business is chosen on a day and the community and different uh, entities encourage people to uh, shop there and spend their money there to promote that business. And what, then most recently- Where did you get that cash mob concept from? Uh, so it came from the concept of flash mob, which is a dance where people meet in one place and meet together. And then slowly it evolved into a, uh, a cash mob. Many chambers of commerce across the country do these and they're very yeah. successful. And we're working uh, with different entities on how to produce this better to bring more money to those businesses. A better okay. question might have been who Commissioner Carthorn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, most, re most recently, we had a seminar about uh, maximizing your business through social media. A lot of our business uh, members, our business owners, didn't know how to necessarily. Uh, use social media to promote their business. So we had a social media guru come in who dropped some gems on how they can promote their business uh, free and uh, when is it time to actually go with the social media manager. And we have many more uh, presentations and seminars coming up, which we'll talk about in uh, the next slide after this one. So uh, this year we decided to have our Minority Business Expo during the uh, Bayou Classic weekend. We thought it would be best with the um, with all the money that'll be in town, and it'll also be a great opportunity for uh, business owners to promote their businesses to different markets. Uh, one of the things, uh, sorry, our special guest will be Supercent. She is uh, a New Orleans native who basically grew her grew her uh, makeup company, multi million dollar company, in about eight months. So what we found is a lot of uh, business owners here have businesses that are in the health and beauty market. So we feel that Supercell would be a great person for them to listen to and get advice with uh, about growing their business. And as you can see, we'll also have several different panels that weekend, uh, women's empowerment, small business, health and beauty, uh, the future and importance of HBCUs, as well as an activist and attorneys panel. And we'll have some black elected officials uh, from around the country that are coming here to uh, talk as well. So uh, for 2021, we will also have these seminars and lunch and learns coming up uh, in no particular order, but I'm glad that Commissioner Burrell mentioned that uh, a lot of minority business owners don't necessarily know the avenues to um, navigate with some of these bigger corporations. So we're planning to do a supplier diversity training and also procurement. And then as well as uh, many business owners we found out don't necessarily know the process, the correct process to obtaining a uh, business license. So we'll have a seminar on that as well. Okay, and so that pretty much wraps up my presentation. I wanted to give you guys some information about how to join the chamber and get in contact with me if you have any questions. Okay, there, thank you very much. Uh, are there any committee members with uh, any questions? Uh, Mr. Chairman, where, where would the Black, Black Expo be this time down at the convention center? Yes, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. It'll be at the convention center April 15th through the 17th. Okay, thank you. I see Commissioner Jackson has his hands hand raised. Uh, yes, I was just going to say, I talked to, uh, appreciate it, Commissioner Cawthorn. I know I'm not a member of the committee, but I did talk to uh, Billy and they explained what they had going on. I do think that they are working on some of the um, some of the issues that have been identified by administration. But my hope is that the committee will uh, consider uh, their application favorably and move it forward to the full body. Um, and we can kind of help them maybe work out the issues that I think you identified in the introduction. Um, 
as they go forward. But I think it's a definitely a worthwhile uh, endeavor. Okay. Mr. Chairman, committee yes, sir. Mr. Mr. Commissioner Burrell. I haven't seen their I haven't seen their request. It may have been in here. I, I just haven't uh, opened up the, the document. Uh, but uh, what is the request? Is it uh, a request from the uh, uh, Black I mean from the Shreveport African American Chamber? Uh, financial request is what we are what we're looking at. Yes. Okay. How much is that? Twenty five. Twenty five thousand, which is what we've given to them annually over the last five years. Okay. It's just that they haven't got the application in. That's what I'm hearing. The application is in. But well, I tell you what, let me pivot to Haley so she can update us with that documentation. Okay. <clears throat> so what was the question, Commissioner Cawthorn? Uh, were you uh, asking uh, the application yeah, you, was in? Yeah. Yeah, for the uh, Shreveport Bossier African American Chamber, they do have an application. Yes, sir. I think they're, uh, we are working with them now to get some clarity on their report from prior year, but they do have a current application. Okay, so current application, we're waiting on the, the 2019 report from the last funding cycle, well, or the last time they were funded, correct? Yes, sir, and okay. uh, my staff's working with Mr. Anderson's staff to clear that up now. Okay, all right, thank you very much, and that will with that being done and that being said, uh, once we get to the 19 report in, then that gives them a, a clean bill of health to be able to move forward to accept additional money from the parish, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Lynn, this is Brittany Dunn. Can I say something for a second? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm the uh, current chairperson of the African American Chamber of Commerce. And I just want to say that we went through a transition of an executive director uh, change around November and October to where Billy came on and we went through a transition of a chairperson change. And so me and Billy just realized uh, about three and a half weeks to four weeks ago that the application hadn't been put in, um, which it should have been put in place in 2020. Um, so that's the reason we're coming to you all so late. We actually were in the board meeting and discussing the 25,000 being added to the budget only to find out that that application wasn't in place. So we do apologize for, you know, having to have a special uh, meeting and asking for these funds late in the game, but we would appreciate if you guys would award us with this request. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there any additional questions uh, from the board members? I mean, committee members, I'm sorry. If not, I'd like to make a motion now that uh, that we move forward with a $25,000 request to the African American Chamber of Commerce contingent upon the completion of the, two nine, the, nine, the 2019 uh, final, final financial report. If I can get a second. Second, second Mr. Chairman. All right, that second came from Commissioner Barrera. Okay, it has been properly moved and second. Uh, moved by the chair, second by Commissioner Burrell. Uh Mr. Clerk, can we get a roll call vote? Absolutely, Commissioner Cawthorn. Yes. Play a video. I'm sorry, I heard some. Um, I heard some feedback there. Um, Commissioner Gage Watts. Yes. Commissioner Atkins is absent. Commissioner Young. Yes. Commissioner Burrell. Yes. And Commissioner Johnson. Yes. All right, that uh, motion passes with five of six in support and one absent. All righty. Thank you guys very much. We will move along to our next request. And this is from uh, Cyport. And we have the director on the line Miss uh, Diane Clark, she, I heard her earlier, I see her, I see her. Uh, without any further ado, we'll let you dump right into your presentation. She's having some technical problems. Is Miss Clark? Are we, are we on live now? You're, are, we can hear you. Okay, well, thank you so much for having us. We certainly appreciate this opportunity. Uh, this is a first for me. As you know, um, Cyport came back in 2018 and we are learning the ropes as we go. 
And so we appreciate your patience with us as we figure this whole process out. Uh, today, I am joined in our presentation with Ian Summers, who's our marketing manager, and Bianca Frazier. And I'm proud to introduce her as the new director of our STEM Center, which you'll hear about more as we move forward. I have uh, shared a slide that shows you our mission statement. Honestly, I am not sure the level of um, knowledge that all of the commissioners have about Cyport and what we've been through. So bear with me. I do just want to kind of go over the fact, and you can change slides, Jeff, if you will, but we were reestablished in 2018. And, and I don't think I have to go into the details of some of the things that happened, but um, we have come back strong. You'll see in the application packet that there is quite a lot of financial information that shows that in 19, we were on a roll. We were approaching a million dollars in revenue coming back from zero and then COVID hit, but, but we're coming back. We're coming up with some innovative ways to do that. And so one of the things that we want to stress in today's presentation is the fact that we are so much more than a building. And I failed to mention that Commissioner Jackson, I believe is still online. Yes. yes. And um, he's been instrumental in working with us and helping us and, and leading us through this process. Thank you for that, Commissioner Jackson. Uh, you may have to interrupt if you see I'm getting off, off track anywhere. But we are so much more than a building in that we see ourselves as a community anchor. And we've developed a number of partnerships in this last two and a half years. We applied for a grant with the Rotary, the Downtown Rotary, and we were able to provide the Itty Bitty Scientist program. We partnered with Shreve Memorial Library. In addition to having passes that you can check out to get in free admission, they uh, installed a little library in our Power of Play area and every month they deliver a new set of books and uh, we're able to offer the, the visitors, our little children, new books every month. We lease out a space to uh, Eric McFarland, Bricks and Bots lease agreement. And it's a lucrative agreement for the two of us where we share in some revenue, but he has a wealth of information to share with us in the STEM related fields. And then KTBS reached out early on and they put in about a $35,000 weather watcher station in the downstairs when we were desperate need of getting something new in the center. And um, pre-COVID, we were having the junior weather watchers out here all of the time and it was a fun activity to watch. We're hoping that will come back. All right, next slide, please. One of the things you may not realize is that Cyport, because I didn't know this when I got here, but Cyport is a huge part of the community activities, the educational activities that are taking place. And one of the most recognized programs that we have is called Bars Without Barriers. And that has been offered at Caddo Correctional Center. It's a 12 week program where on one Wednesday, we go in and we teach the offenders a science program. And on the next Wednesday, pre-COVID, when they were allowed to have visitors, they turned around and taught that same program to either their children, their uh, brothers and sisters, their nieces, their nephews, whoever the youth were that were coming to visit them, they had an opportunity to present that program. And we just got recognized and have just made a presentation through Yale University for the work that we've done. Uh, David Boone with, with that program has worked very, very closely with us. It's been a successful venture for us. We also serve immigrant and homeless children each summer through a grant we received called GSK Science in the Summer. So that's just a little bit of a quick overview on some of the things we do out in the community that you might not have been aware of. Next slide, please. We serve, Cyport serves as the fiscal sponsor for the North Louisiana STEM Alliance. The STEM Alliance represents 180 members from over 80 organizations throughout North Louisiana. 
and it is designed to focus on science, technology, engineering, and math. And as you saw from our mission in the first slide that we put up, everything we do is designed around providing STEM educational opportunities. So when you take all of that um, information and you put it together and you look at the impact that we have, that's why in our application, we decided that going through the Econo Economic Development Committee would be the best avenue for us. Commissioner Jackson agreed with us and said that he felt like this was the step to take. So next slide, please. Just to give you an idea of where we are, we went from, and keep in mind that in 2018, we did not open until October of that year. We were able to reopen the first floor only. And so you can see the number of visitors that we had. You can see the uh, gate revenues that we experienced with a high of almost was $922,000 in 2019. And then COVID of course impacted our ability to uh, see that kind of revenue again. But we're on our way back up. 2021 represents January, February and some of March. Next slide, please. This is just a graphic of a recent study that we have uh, been Sending out, it's a survey, and it's also taking zip codes on the days when we have free admission. And that gives you a general idea of the draw that we currently have to Cyport. Next slide. This is just a, a little pie chart showing you that we have a number of free programming uh, educational opportunities that include the four free admission days, we've used the Act 10 and Act 1 money to fund. And some of the summer camps, some of the teacher workshops, some of our grant programming, just giving you a quick overview of uh, free programming that we offer. Next slide. This is just, I know it's difficult to see, Really, it was just an impact slide to let you know that we do have quite a number of grants that we are working on, several that have closed out. Uh, we'll, I'll be happy to have Jeff share this PowerPoint slide with anyone who would want it, but I just didn't want to get through this without at least talking about the fact that we do have several grant-funded initiatives that are allowing us to fulfill our mission. Next slide, please. All right, we're talking yes. again. Yes, okay. so Ian will present this section. So really quickly, gentlemen, I'm actually familiar with specialty programming at Cyport. So what we have discovered that is that specialty programming really drives traffic to Cyport. You're looking for that really fun kind of different experience. So giving you some examples, uh, anytime we do a special, uh, any kind of special program or a special Saturday program, it usually brings in three to time, five times higher return on investment than general admission. And also looking at uh, some of the examples, free admission days, which we've had three so far uh, in the past six months, which have been phenomenally successful. Uh, Snowport 2020 and 2021 have been amazing. Uh, and then we have actually sub events within those like Elsa and Olaf at Snowport and then Baby Shark Day at Snowport. So those were two fun days where we actually had char uh, character actors come in dressed as Elsa and Olaf from Frozen. Most younger children really love Frozen. But what was even more fun was when we did Baby Shark Day. So we had someone come in as Daddy Shark. I didn't realize that there's different different sharks, so I don't watch it. But uh, and I don't have I don't have children. But we also did a really fun collaborative, and this is where I think we really really shine. We created a collaborative with a local jazz musician and also with the Shreveport Symphony Orchestra. And between uh, Alter Ego Jazz and also Michael Butterman, the conductor of the symphony, we created a Baby Shark sing-along symph uh, symphonic movement, uh, which was just really fun. It was exposing young children to the symphony to music, but also to STEM and STEAM. Uh, another day we had was Military and First Responders Day at Cyborg. That was actually this past January. This was, it was a way to thank military and first responders during the pandemic. They have done so much for our community and we wanted to give back. Uh, our indoor Mardi Gras parade was fantastic. So that's something we teamed up with Raising Canes and they were our title sponsor of that. 
but even more so, we noticed that there was not much going on in the community for Mardi Gras for children. So we created this indoor Mardi Gras experience with, um, with a second line brass band with uh, Robert Trudeau. Yet again, phenomenally attended event. People loved it. And I really, really love our last event. It was our uh, Black History Day at Cypher, which was the last Saturday of February. And yet again, looking at collaborative uh, uh, potential, I actually reached out to the Mahogany Ensemble Theater and we actually had a living Black History, uh, Black History uh, actors actually around the center. So we had uh, character actors of Garrett Morgan, George Washington Carver, Mae Jemison, and also Madam C.J. Walker. So it was an interactive living, breathing history experience for children which that was extremely well uh, attended as well. That was one of our free days. And currently we have Moonport, which is actually kind of a continuation of Snowport. We actually re-engineered some of the uh, exhibits within Snowport and kind of gave them a, a moon space theme. Uh, Jeff, next slide, please. Oh, I think we skipped a slide. Okay. Did we? No, we didn't. No, that's good, yeah. that's right, mm -hmm. okay. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and present this slide. My name is Bianca Frazier again, and I am the new um, director for the Regional STEM Network System that is here at SciPort. Um, this is from a federal initiative that has come down to the state, and it's part of um, basically what we've been talking about, you know, earlier on this call is to expand um, STEM activities, educational opportunities, and access to the greater community. And so the Regional STEM Network is a system of STEM leaderships that are strategically posi positioned across Louisiana. And these um, regions mirror the Louisiana Workforce Commission's parishes, community parishes, regional, regional parishes. And so the whole point of this is to, um, is so that the state can help to achieve access to STEM education, participation, and advancement. This also includes opportunities specifically for the under, underrepresented and underserved populations to engage them in the STEM workforce and to prepare them for the 21st century of work. Um, region seven, which is our region, encompasses 10 parishes in Northwest Louisiana, which are Caddo, Webster, Claiborne, Lincoln, Beanville, um, Red River, DeSoto, Sabine, and Natchitoches parishes. Next slide. And so as you can see here, this is what the nine regional STEM centers look like. Um, what's interesting about this is that the majority of the centers are placed at community colleges and universities. Um, SciPort was selected, which um, demonstrates our commitment to STEM education and access to a greater community. So um, the greater New Orleans community, um, Chamber of Commerce also is a STEM center, which is one of the only ones that's not a college or university, which I think that is awesome. I think that it will provide a lot of opportunities and it will allow us to have a deeper, a deeper reach and provide more access to students, families, um, faith-based organizations, just the community at large, um, really giving us an opportunity to scale the work that we're doing. And I've been in my role week two, so I'm on two weeks in, <laughs> and I've already been approached by Google for a partnership. I've also been approached by STEM NOLA, Dr. Calvin Mackey. I have a meeting with him next week to scale opportunities in our area. Um, I also have been approached by, um, but several people are reaching out <laughs> just to go ahead. It's very exciting, it's kind of overwhelming because again, I'm week two in, but there's so many opportunities here for us to scale and replicate some of the things that are happening all over the state here through Cypher. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, and I'm just gonna zip through this. These are kind of things that, um, or did you want this one? I'll, yeah. I'll cover this okay. one real quick if you don't mind. This was our missing slide a while ago, my fault. Um, the whole application packet revolves around asking for $50,000 of funding for Gangport 2020. And it is not designed to be just a one-time hit and run. We've got a lot of long-term benefits built into this uh, request. The Gangport itself is designed to attract visitors of all ages to engage in your STEM educational opportunities. And we are focusing on providing coding and gaming opportunities. Uh, you've probably seen the information that came out showing the local high schools who were getting into the esports arena. 
So we realize that if we want to attract our, our young uh, students and keep them motivated to go through STEM-based career training so that they will stay here and provide a productive workforce, we've got to catch them where we can. And gaming seems to be one of the areas where we feel like we can reach out and, and capture their attention. And so the game port exhibit itself would promote edutainment, which is a new method of interactive learning, and hopefully attract gamers from throughout, not just the area, but potentially from around the country. I'm coming to learn that gaming is very uh, big and Bionica has actually attended a, one of their larger events and she's providing us with a lot of insight. And then of course, we, it's designed to enhance the workforce opportunities by creating that skilled trained workforce starting where we are at all ages because we've got this um, game board is designed to attract people where they are right now try to engage them and keep them moving forward. There are three economic impacts that we think would fall from this. Uh, we'll capture revenue from visitors coming into the city. We will be able to prepare a workforce that's skilled and trained. And hopefully we will create Shreveport as a nexus for the digital gaming industry and help create that our city as a place for people to come. All right, next slide, please. And these are just some statistics and we can kind of zip through these slides just to show the importance of gaming and how gaming and gaming educational opportunities and activities can encourage a type of STEM or STEAM um, engagement. So 97% of tweens and teens regularly play computer and video games and that's increased during the pandemic. Next slide. Uh, this was just a cool quote. I found it very interesting. Um, it's by the Federation of American Scientists on gaming. Just the, the success of complex, complex video games demonstrates that games can teach higher order thinking skills, which is primarily what we want. We wanna see students and children thinking and being innovative, and this will absolutely, absolutely give them an opportunity to do that. And it also op offers inclusivity, so all students can do gaming. And it's fun. It doesn't seem like it's learning, but they are. And next slide. Um, currently, we partner with Wanda Brandon for both with Girls Who Code. We also partner with the Shreve Memorial Library with the Mobile Makerspace Band, which is very cool, but also opportunities for students to think, play, learn. Um, and we continue, we want to continue to develop additional partners to participate in that. Next slide. Again, this is just another slide to show when you talk about the economic impact and when businesses are coming to the area looking for um, people that are well trained in different disciplines, it shows this kind of demonstrates how gaming is more than just writing code. There are other things like music and sound, game design, arts business, critical thinking, all kinds of things like that, just kind of interdisciplinary. Next slide. And I just, I'm, I'm an educator, so I think that little digital graphs like this are, are great for just demonstrating the importance and how things work together. And so this is just the, the design game and just giving you an idea of why we know it's important and can be so impactful to our area. Just the other ways that students learn through gaming. Next slide. Okay, so we're just talking about Stanford for a brief second. Yeah, really trying to add home economic impact and specialty event programming here at Cyport. So Stanford 2020 Icicle Forest hosted 5,776 visitors. That is amazing uh, for uh, Cyport. Also our initial investment to build uh, Stanford, which was all done by local fabricators. So local talent we didn't bring on in was 30,000. And off of ticket sales, uh, we have $115,779.29, which is roughly a 3.5 times return on investment. Uh, and of course, that's investment back also in our community. And then also, we work very closely with the Tourism Bureau, and they used to they created a marketing study for me through LexisNexis, which actually shows you where you're mentioned within the community, also through newspaper publications and any digital media assets. So for our initial investment for about $3,500, 
Uh, we actually had a 21 times higher return on investment advertising. So we reached a ton of folks. Next slide. And these are just a series of photographs we can flip through. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Next slide. And then our final slide is just showing you some of the partners that worked with us. And so that is our presentation. And um, Commissioner Jackson, is there anything you would like to add that we've left out? Uh, I, I don't have anything to add. Um, again, I'm not on this particular committee, but uh, um, I have talked, uh, Southport is in my district, I have talked uh, to the new director um, uh, in the past, I have made them aware of our uh, budgetary challenges and things of that nature. Um, and that we're, you know, we try to help where we can, um, uh, but that doesn't always, that doesn't always mean we can always do it, but I, I would hope that the committee would see fit to forward uh, something to the body uh, for consideration, um, even if we had to, uh, um, I don't know if this would fit any other COVID pieces, but even if we had to reimburse ourselves, I can see I can see the benefit of it. I definitely, and I hope all others will see the benefit of uh, how we build a knowledge-based economy um, uh, here in Shreveport, Caddo. Uh, we just had the conversation about Skeeter and things of that nature and how we diversify our economy, not to just be solely dependent upon one particular area or arena. And so, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I just hope at some point uh, that there would be some um, something for the full body um, to consider. I would like to point out that this is one of either four or five uh, spots that the Board of Regents has designated uh, as sort of a STEM hub and so that's the role that Southport is playing. That's the role that the Gameport piece will play, uh, even as playing their role in the e education arena, there is an economic impact uh, and benefit uh, to this region. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask also that whatever is considered that um, we would encourage Southport to also uh, reach out to the city of Shreveport to maybe go half uh, on the ask and some of the other downtown stakeholders to go have on the half on the ask as well. So um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. I see we got two hands raised. Uh, Commissioner Johnson first, then Commissioner Burrell. I'd like to make a recommendation to the full body for $35,000 on behalf of Southport. <clears throat> I'll second that. Right. Uh, so, so yeah, so it's been moved. Let me do this. Let me go ahead and put the motion on, on the floor and let's see if uh, Commissioner Burrell wants to speak to the recommendation or does he have a, another topic he wants to speak to? I mean, not another topic, another concern about. No more, than, no, no more than funding, Mr. Chairman. That's what we're here for. Okay. Uh, my question. My question is, I, I, I know, uh, you know, in, in being a nonprofit ourselves, we looked at a lot of, of, of STEM opportunities, STEM opportunities that are out there, grant opportunities. Uh, have they pretty well exhausted the, the, the STEM grant uh, search for, for resources? Because there, there appear to be quite a few of them out there. There are, it's just that there are such strict timelines we have exhausted the grants that we've been able to identify that have a timeline that falls within the time frame that we need to get this up and going by summer. Uh, but I can assure you, we continue that. We have 17 ongoing grants right now and we continue to look for grants. And if there's any way that we can come back to you and say that we found some additional resources, I will certainly promise to do that. Okay. The other thing that comes to mind is, is uh, again, on uh, COVID funding. Uh, I know Commissioner uh, uh, Jackson mentioned that, but uh, it appears that your operation 
was also affected by COVID negatively. Aren't there funds out there uh, to support something like that? I know in terms of nonprofits or private business that they are. So have you all tapped into that? The, the only uh, COVID funds that we have been able to apply for are the PPP loans. Uh, it was important that we keep our staff uh, hired and paid throughout all of this. So we applied for the first PPP loan. Then we got the second PPP loan, which we are working through now, but that is strictly limited for us for payroll purposes. A lot of the other grants that are out there say that if you receive PPP, you can't qualify for any other funds. So, you know, it's been what, over a year since we moved forward with PPP, not realizing at the time that by accepting the PPP, it would cut us out of many other opportunities. Okay. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman, that's my question. I, I, uh, as we continue to discuss this, uh, Commissioner, Je Commissioner Johnson and I, spoke of a few days ago. Uh, as I look at and listen to the proposal, it sounds more as a funding opportunity that will fall in the NGO. Uh, I know that Mr. I mean, Commissioner Johnson is the chair of the NGO. If we rate, make the recommendation coming out of economic development, is Ms. Attorney Frazier available? Uh, what would be the proper way to move this out of this committee to uh, NGO, or do we need to make a recommendation coming out of this committee today? And, and if that's okay with with the recommendation with Mr. Johnson. Commissioner point of Johnson. clarification, point of clarification, Mr. Chairman, uh, is, okay. isn't this economic development too? Say that again. I said, isn't uh, you know from what I heard in the discussion, this is also economic development too. This project. It's bringing it in visitors from outside of the city and generating hotel stays. Um, that's why we selected economic development, but certainly y'all are the wiser. Well, I mean, it, it, from, it just from my vantage point, it's, it seems more like a uh, NGO type of funding mechanism, uh, opportunity rather. Uh, I didn't get, since, since we don't have what would be the economic impact study, these type of uh, investments of grant opportunities that we, that we give to people, that's a longer payoff in, in my estimation. So I'm not arguing the fact whether it's an NGO or whether it's an economic development per se, just from my vantage point, I see it more as an NGO and it was where I was kind of directing that to Commissioner Johnson to get his insight. Uh, I would like to hear what uh, Attorney Frazier has to say. Okay. Um, commissioners, it was my understanding that maybe I have that wrong. I thought some economic development information was presented during the presentation, uh, which if I'm correct about that, that um, means that there is information to support uh, what the economic impact would be. It could stay in this committee. If you wish it, wish to move it to another committee and the majority votes to do that, then uh, you can move it to Commissioner Johnson's committee and um, he can decide whether or not his committee will hear it or whether or not um, something will uh, move directly to the floor, to the body. Okay, can I make this peace offering? Uh, when Mr. Commissioner Johnson has a $35,000 commitment, I mean, uh, motion on the floor um, to uh, for the grant funding, let's split the difference. Let's do 17.5 in economic development and 17.5 in, in NGL. I can go along with that. Uh, I just had to schedule an NGO meeting. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, the reason why I said that is because they did have uh, uh, some economic impact information because the only way you're going to figure out ROI is that you do have economic development uh, information, impact information. That's so. all. Okay. Uh, you can roll. Yeah, um, yeah so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and present that as a, as a uh, motion. Substitute yeah. motion. Would that be a substitute motion? Be a dis uh, uh, amendment to the original motion. Okay. 
I I would second it. That'd be fine. Okay. Uh, roll call vote, uh, Mr. Mr. Clark. Mr. Chairman, I have a question for you before y'all roll call. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I have a question. Um, by going to the double committees, will they need, would they, well, first of all, I guess I, my question is how did it end up in economic development? Who determined that? That's a real long, it's a long story, but actually it was a recommendation from Commissioner Chavez Oh. After he had a conversation with the director at Sideport. Uh, I mean, we don't need we don't need to split hairs on this. Uh, I just feel it's more of a an NGO. Yeah. Uh, funding no, 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 no. I, I I get it. I just you know that's why I try to that's why I try to encourage people. And I didn't know that Commissioner Chavez suggested economic. I I just kind of when they came to me, I kind of just went along with whatever was going. And again, this is why I often say. You know, we have that little part on the form. Um, Dr. Wilson, Haley, Donna, we have that part on the form, Jeff, that talks about who's your commissioner and what district you're in. You know, and that's why I try to encourage people to start. You know, if you're filling out the form and it says who's your commissioner and who's your district, that's usually where your conversation needs to start because now I guess do they need to come back to the NGO committee? And do what they would that trigger two different reports now? Uh, Attorney Frazier and Miss Barnett would that trigger two different yeah. reports? And would that now would that now trigger another application that they would also have to do? Because you you got to have economic reporting to show economic, and then you've got to have NGO reporting to show community that that kind of thing. And so, you uh, I know you don't want to split the hairs, but that's in reality, what's going to eventually happen. Right, well, let's get a recommendation from the attorney. Yeah. Um, they would be able to report on one form. We um, have two sheets in our form, one where they can report the economic impact okay. um, and one where they can um, report their uh, social welfare impact. Okay. So it would not necessarily require two reports. And not two applications either? Um, no, not if, not if uh, the commission decides to fund it from both funds. Okay, and then the, my, my last question is, would this trigger two different ordinances at that point? Because the way I'm hearing the motions is one ordinance would come out of whatever economic- There would have to be two ordinances. Huh? I, unless I prefer we, to see delays. On that because I don't understand why she couldn't put the two different funds on the same ordinance, but- So yeah. you, 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 phrase, you blanked out on, on my end. Your beginning blanked out. Say that I, again. I say I I would um, defer to Miss Barnett because I think she could put the um, the two diff reference to two different funds on the same ordinance. Okay, that is correct, Donna. I could have one ordinance, and then just if y'all want to do half and half, I would just indicate that. Okay. Uh, at the bottom. Okay. Uh, but just for okay. reference, I'm looking at the application, and on the application. They marked economic development. So I'm assuming that's probably why it got sent to this committee because that's how they identified uh, the purpose of their funds. Oh, good. Okay. okay. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, let's go ahead and move forward with the motion. Mr. Clark. Okay. Ready for the roll call vote. Commissioner Cawthorn. Yes. Commissioner Gage Watts. No. Oh, I think she dropped off. Um, yeah, Commissioner Atkins is absent. Uh, Commissioner Young. Yes. Commissioner Burrell. Yes. And Commissioner Johnson. Yes. All right, that motion carries with four of six uh, in support and two absent. All righty. Well, I want thank everybody for attending this evening. I'll entertain a motion for adjournment. So move. So move. All right. Yes, Thank take care. you so much. Thank you. Have a great one.